Hello, hopefully you enjoyed this upcoming performance from National E Theatre. If you do, uh, well, all of the artists taking part in this project, writers, directors and actors, are self-employed and currently unemployed thanks to the coronavirus outbreak here in the UK. And so if you want to support them, you can do so by visiting the links, which will be in the description below the video, and you can donate as little or as much as you want to and feel able to. Uh, that money will all be distributed evenly among all the artists taking part. If you can't do that, at the very least, we'd love you to be able to share the videos on your social media accounts, on Facebook, on Twitter, with a friend who might be missing their weekly trip to the theatre. Anyone you think might enjoy it, uh, that is also a massive help. You can follow the project and uh, be alerted to any upcoming videos by following the channel, uh, which you can do so up above, or you can follow us on Twitter on at National E Theatre. Thank you for watching and sit back now and enjoy the show. A thing they don't tell you about death is that everybody shits themselves. Not like figuratively, not like, oh my god, I'm about to die, I think I'm going to shit myself. <laughs> like, every muscle in your body relaxes, and that includes your sphincter. So hello, zombie turds. If you're lucky, it happens in the morgue. Well, well not you, me. If I'm lucky, it happens in the morgue, because you're dead. I'm lucky it happens in the morgue, because if it doesn't happen in the morgue, then it happens in the back of my van, and I have to clean it up with a J cloth. I work in a funeral home, I'm, I'm not a pervert. That's what they call this. Funeral home. It goes, family home, care home, funeral home, grave. And zombie shits aside, I really like my job. People think it's gross or weird, but two people die every second. And as well as being obviously sad, if people like me didn't do jobs like this, you'd be tripping over corpses in the co-op. People don't want to think about... People don't think about us because they don't want to think about us. They don't, they don't see us because they don't want to see us, but there's a whole industry of us. And it's a good gig. Every day is different, the people are... Right now, to be honest, I am a little bit worried that I'm going to get fired. It's sort of been a long time coming. You'd be surprised at how many different times you can disastrously fuck up in a funeral home. Like... Like when I was riding on the gurney, right, like you do on a supermarket trolley, and I lost control and I crashed into a stack of cardboard coffins. It took us ages to roll everybody back into the right ones. 
Or when I forgot to remove Mr. Martinez's pacemaker before cremating him and it exploded. Or, okay, this one is bad, but, right, you can get your ashes posted out to a loved one if they can't make the trip to the crematorium, right? And one day I was in charge of posting out the ashes and I totally fucked up on the postage. So this box get returns to us. None of us were expecting it. So we opened it and all this powder came out and we thought it was anthrax. So we had to get a bomb squad to come and test it. And of course it weren't anthrax. It was Mrs. Pendergast and the bomb squad were so mad at me. As was Mrs. Pendergast's daughter. Then probably a ghost. Ghosts aren't real. Nobody's ever haunted me. Not even Mr. Carmichael, after I puked into his head wound. <laughs> I have pissed off a lot of dead people. I often sleep alone in an empty crematorium and still no ghostly visitations. So the cold embrace of death is all there is, my friends. <laughs> I'm not trying to fuck up or be disrespectful, you know. I, I care about everybody that comes in through those doors. It's just hard to help myself sometimes. And everybody fucks up at work, don't they? Imagine if every time you'd fucked up it involves someone's mortal remains. My boss, Gary, he gets, like, disappointed with me. But eventually he can roll his eyes, you know, laugh it off. It's a hard place to work. We see a lot of shit. You've, you've got to keep your sense of humour. He gets it. But this time, he's properly, seriously pissed. Which is really unfair, to be honest, because I don't even think that this time is... Is that... Is that bad? I don't... When people die at home, we get to take the gurney right to them. So I get to see inside loads of people's houses. And it started when I was called out to do this pickup at a big fancy house out in the suburbs. Mr. Sanderson, 58, dead on the sofa. And this place is plush, big iron gates, driveway, three cars, a swimming pool, a swimming pool in London. Usually it's the wife or the kids that let me in. This was a maid in a proper maid's outfit. The wife, she's sitting in the kitchen all stiff with dark glasses at this huge marble table, drinking a tea, reading the paper as if her husband weren't dead in the lounge, and she snaps at me. Where the hell have you been? Er, uh, like in the van? You were supposed to be here half an hour ago? Well, right, well you can't snap back at a recent widow, so I just smile and say sorry and, and mumble something about traffic. Well hurry up then. The maid gives me a sort of apology look and then she leads me into the living room and as soon as I see him, my heart just sinks because he's a big guy. And I ain't got nothing against big guys in life, but in death, they're harder to lift and we have to use more kerosene. No, honestly, I, 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 don't, I, I don't like one kind of body any better than I like any other. Like, you, you realise how, how silly all that is when you do my job? Getting up close and personal with every kind of body under the sun. You realise that bodies are basically just disgusting bags of mulch waiting to seep out of every orifice. Even after we're burnt, we're minging. Greasy black ash that gets everywhere. Right, when I blow my nose, about four people's dust comes out. And you should smell me after a day's embalming. Luckily, I live on my own. Otherwise, my flatmates would need to wear hazmat suits just to sit and watch Netflix. So I get him on the gurney and I wheel him out past the big open plan kitchen. The wife doesn't even look up. Doesn't even register that he's leaving. Will you be attending the ceremony? I ask. She doesn't even look up. No. I'll send someone to fetch him. Like he's a parcel? Or a dog? Poor sod. So, I get him into the back of the van. And I get a call from Gary. Another pickup. Could I swing by on my way past? Now, usually we only like to do them one at a time, right? Because it's best to get him into the freezer as quickly as possible. Especially if they're being embalmed. I wouldn't want to be embalmed. Stuffed and 
smoothed and preserved. It's like making a pickle, except it's someone's dad. <laughs> Not for me. Uh, anyway, so you, it's quicker. Usually we're doing one at a time, but this lady's right around the corner and it saves on petrol, right? And Gary is all about saving on costs. And at first I protest because, well, I don't really want to be in the van with Mr. Sanderson when he gets ripe, but Gary insists and I'm sort of still on thin ice from the anthrax scare, so off I go. It's a council flat. Wild about London, in it, All the different kinds of houses so close together. It's an old lady. She lived on her own. She'd been dead a few days and no one known. In the end, one of the neighbours called the council about the smell. Your basic 21st century real-life nightmare. I wish I could tell you it were rare. I've seen a lot of houses, right? And this was the saddest flat I ever saw. Her name was Miss Farley. June. June Farley. Everything was covered in dust, empty tins all over the place. She was sitting in an old armchair, just totally covered in blankets and jumpers. She'd been cold when she died. And she's tiny, like, like this flat is small, but I mean, she just seemed so tiny in it. It was easy to get her onto me trolley. No next of kin, no one to call, no one to pay. Another thing, they don't tell you about death, right, is it? It's expensive. Even a basic funeral can set you back four grand and people don't think to save for it or they can't afford to. And if you can't afford to pay, then you get a council burial. They bury you in a grave with other people, wherever they've got the space. Your next basic 21st century nightmare. And it's clear that no one's coming for Miss Farley's bill. No one's going to... Take her from the home in a fancy, shiny new urn. No, it's going to be a council burial for her. I knew time was pressing because she already smelt pretty awful, bless her. But suddenly... All this just seemed so sad. Whole life boiling down to a bundle of blankets in a shared council grave. So I had a look around. For what? I, I don't know, a, a glimmer of hope? Didn't look like she had any family, no photos of grandkids on the fridge, no, no photos anywhere. The curtains were drawn, shutting everything out. There was a Bible on the dresser in the bedroom and I picked it up and all these papers fell out. One of them was a black and white photo of two young ladies around my age. I th one of them must be June, I think, when she was, my, when she was young. And they were both look... They both look sexy. In these cool trousers and suit jackets and neckties. And then the other woman's got her arm flung around June and she's smoking a cigarette. And you can tell that they're both at that nice point of pissed. There's a folded letter underneath it, like all this spidery old-fashioned handwriting. What will I do with this love? My dear. It will eat me alive. Till I see you, Rosie. They were in love. And I wondered who Rosie was and, and where she was or where she was buried and why they'd lost touch. I put June in the back of the van next to Mr. Sanderson. No chance in hell he'd have ever got close to a person like her in real life. And suddenly, suddenly, all this just seemed so unfair to me how he'd lived and how she'd lived and how he died and how she died and how she was going to a council grave unremarked and uncared for and he was going to get a cremation and a big fancy urn and a memorial plaque and his wife didn't even care enough to fetch him all because he could afford it all because of money and I had an idea see once a body comes to us for a cremation, right, nobody sees it again. We take the personal effects, we seal them up, we burn it, and we give them back, give them back the ashes. So all I needed to do was switch the paperwork. Mr Sanderson, uh, June gets cremated. Mr Sanderson goes to the council grave. I give his family a, a fancy urn of pet ashes from the crematorium next door. And I can keep June. 
and I can return her to, to someone who loves her, maybe even Rosie. Everybody's happy. I swapped the metal ID cards on the bodies and I drove back home. Uh, I drove to the home. I figured as long as I could stay with them the whole way, overseeing everything, making all the necessary adjustments, it'd be fine. And it started off smoothly. We're a small team, right? So Gary was on a hospital pickup. Nish was doing a particularly sticky reconstruction of an open casket. And it was Neil's day off. Nobody saw me wheel June and Mr. Sanderson into the cold room. Nobody saw me carefully removing any metals or jewellery or other effects. All June had on her was a necklace. A little silver locket on a chain and again I know I shouldn't have but I couldn't resist looking inside there was another photo of Rosie in there my stomach did a somersault right wouldn't it be beautiful right if I could track her down and find her and tell her how much June had loved her right until the end I put the locket in one bag and Mr Sanderson's wedding ring into the other I just had to remember that I'd switched them when Mrs Sanderson's Paul Leckie came to fetch him so far so good I put June into the special wooden coffin with Mr Sanderson's ID badge and I'm just about to wheel her into the furnace when Nish pokes his head round the door. Can you give me an arm with Miss Kaminsky? Shit. It won't take long and Gary's nearly back anyway and he can take over in here when he arrives. Shit, shit, shit. See, you can't just bung a body into a furnace, set the oven timer and go, right? A technician, me, has to sit with it the whole process. 45 minutes at least, so I can't blow Nish off for 45 minutes without a proper good reason. And I don't have a proper good reason. Sure, Miss Kaminsky was in a car accident. A family wanted to see the body before we cremate her. So it basically means that we have to put her entire face back together again, which is not a quick and easy process, I'm sure you can imagine. Have you ever tried sticking back together a ear out of putty? takes a long time and all the while all I can think about is June in Mr Sanderson's coffin I keep glancing at the clock I'm sure Nish can hear me art pounding out my ribs and just as I'm gluing a final eyelid shut I hear a commotion outside in the hall and I am just praying that it's not Gary realizing what I've done Nish smiles at me you go deal with that I'll start the furnaces for you don't want to get behind schedule I say no, but he's already on his way out. So I take off my gloves and I run after him and I try and stop him. But, oh my God. Oh my God. Out in the lobby is Mrs. Sanderson. She's talking to Gary and she is not happy about something. He beckons me over. You can't have bloody lost it. Where is it? Gary looks at me like he is dreading that I have fucked something up. Charlie, he says. Do you know what's happened to Mr. Sanderson's wedding ring? What? His wife forgot to remove his ring before you took him. She's come to get it back, but it's not among his personal effects. I sort of just stand there. Of course, this woman wouldn't come for his ashes, but damned if she'll lose his jewellery. If this idiot has lost my husband's ring, she barks. I'm sure we'll find it, madam. Come on, Charlie. Let's go take another look at Mr Sanderson. No. I shout, no. I am... Definitely, certain he didn't have a ring on. I looked especially. Gary looks at me, suspicious. And these are definitely his effects. I don't recognise this at all, snaps Mrs Sanderson. And she holds up June's locket. Well, I say. I'm sorry, but those are definitely his belongings. That's all I found on him. Honest. I know it's bad to lie, but I am so far into this lie now that a lie is the only way out. And she looks at me and I'm sure she's going to scream. She's going to she's gonna let rip at me. She's going to threaten to sue. But then suddenly her lip quivers and her face crumples and she just bursts into tears. Then who's this? She opens up the locket to the photo of Rosie. Who is this woman? Why did she, why did he die with a photo of her and not his ring? She's crying, shaking. 
and I realise, oh my God, oh my God, she did love him. Oh my God, she is so sad. Oh my God, I have fucked up. And I'm trying to figure out a way around this to try and make something, to say something, to give, to give me time to figure it out when I hear a really, truly horrifying noise coming from the machines next door. And I realise that Nish has started. And now I know that we all have to get out of the building as quickly as possible because we'll remember that I said that Mr. Sanderson didn't have a pacemaker so it wasn't on his paperwork. But now I realise June did. And remember how I said pacemakers can explode in the furnace? And remember how I said that Mr. Sanderson would need extra kerosene? Bang! Nobody was hurt. Thank God. <laughs> uh, the machine was destroyed. And June, and, and probably my career. I lied to Mrs. Sanderson. I said it was an honest mistake that I'd mixed up the paperwork and that at least nothing had happened to her husband. We still had his body. We could give them the cremation and the fancy urn that they wanted. She got to take him back to that big empty house behind the gates. He was wearing his, he was wearing his ring. She got it back. It had their anniversary engraved in the middle. I guess grief can make you hard sometimes. I guess it can come out sideways. I told Gary the truth. At first, he was so mad he couldn't even look at me. And then eventually he said, you can't fix people's lives after they're dead. And even if you could, that's not your job. But I'm not sure about that. I felt, I felt like it was, I felt like it was my job when I saw her there all alone in that flat. And I know after all of this, I should leave it, but I just think, I'm going to try and find Rosie, if she's alive. There's nothing left of June to give her, but I did manage to keep the locket. It's not much to go on a name and a photo, but I want to try. I want to meet her and, and ask her about the June from the photo. In the suit with the cigarette, nicely drunk with Rosie's arm flung around her. I want to ask her about the night she gave June the locket. I can't stop thinking about it. I imagine Rosie picking out a favourite picture of herself and cutting it up with with small scissors. I, I imagine her doing the fiddly bit of, of sliding it into the locket. I imagine her picking out a nice box, nice tissue to, to wrap it in. I imagine it burning in a pocket on the bus on the way to their date. I imagine them in the pub, stealing glances, not allowed to touch. Walking along the river, at lamplight, the air between them, electric. I imagine her almost losing a nerve, not going for it. But then taking out the box from a pocket, watching June as she unwraps it, nervous and excited. I imagine June's face, when it hits her, the love that's gone into that gift. When she unclicks a clasp and opens it and sees the face of the woman she loves. I see every moment June unclicks that clasp through a whole life. In a bedroom, in lifts, on buses, in the queue at the supermarket, at the post office. In a kitchen, quietly, at a party while other people count in a new year. In a hospital waiting room. Alone, in a chair, under the blankets. The cold of it on her skin. A gesture 
50 years old. Pickled and preserved in love. I hope Gary doesn't fire me. All my friends are the people working here. Sometimes I don't even go home at night. Don't tell Gary. It's just nicer in the funeral home. It's warm in the evening from the furnaces and cool in the morning when they've wound down. It's quiet. Even when there's no people here, there's people here. Hundreds of people have been wheeled through those doors and into my machines and I remember the faces of every single one of them. It's like they're still here. Some dust of them probably still is. I like this job. Every day is different, the people... You learn a lot. 